Do you see the um, the slide in front of I you? I do. Yes, okay. I do. Great. Yep. All right. Uh, thank you, everybody. My name is Barb Hedstrom, and we're going to call the meeting started here for the Scott County Parks Advisory Commission for February 3rd, and we'll start with roll call. And I will call your name and please respond. And I apologize if there's a little bit of a delay lag. If that continues, um, please let me know and we can address that further. So I'll start with roll call. Kristen French. Here. Kathy Gerlach. Here. Jerry Hennon. Jerry was here. Okay, I'll circle back to Jerry. We'll continue with the roll call. Eric Spieler. Here. Patrick Stieg. Here. Mark Ewart. Here. Commissioner Ulrich. Here. Jerry Hennon. He looks like he's muted and they're working on it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, there. believe me, I'm not one to uh, throw any criticisms. Can you hear me now? Yes, Jerry. Yeah. Okay, I'm here. All right, great. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, next, we'll proceed to the Pledge of Allegiance. Under a different technology plan, I would have had a flag behind me. Um, but mm. since I don't, I hope you all uh, can locate one. And please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to, the flag to the flag of the United, United States, States of America, America and to the Republic, to the Republic for which it stands. Which it stands. One nation, One nation under God, under God. Indivisible, indivisible, with yeah, liberty and justice, justice for all. Great. Thank you, everyone. Next, we're going to move on to approving the agenda. Pardon me, but I have to ask again, <laughs> can you see the introductory items? Yes, I can. You? Okay. Thank you, Patty. Great. Yep. Uh, so looking at the agenda, um, do we have any changes or additions, Patty? Um, I don't have any, none from staff. Um, and addressing the board, does any board member have any change or addition that we need to be aware of or brought to my attention at this time? Hearing none. I'll make I a motion. Will... We accept the agenda as presented. I'll second that. Gerlach. Hannon. Thank you, Commissioners Hennon and Gerlach, for the motion to accept the agenda. Um, let's take a vote on that. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, that motion's been approved. Next, we'll look at our next agenda item, which is approve the meeting minutes from January 6th, 2021. At this time, does anyone have any changes? to the minutes. I got a small thing under nine, a number two state lotter, should be lottery. Small thing, but if you wanna yep. make them up. I don't know what the state lottery is. I know what the state lottery is. Yeah. Great, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Gerlach. Does anybody else see any other additions or changes? Hearing no other comments, I will entertain a motion to approve the minutes as modified. Motion, Spieler. Second, French. All those in favor of approving the minutes as modified? Please say aye. 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 We'll go ahead and note that the approval of those minutes for January 6th. We'll proceed on to our agenda item number five, 
Uh, Patty, are you aware of any requests from any interested citizens to not, comment on heard. anything? Oops, sorry, I've not heard from anyone. All right, thank you. You're welcome. We'll proceed on to item number six. Uh, 6A, I believe, maintenance, 2020 highlights and 2021 plans. And I believe we have Justin here joining us today. Yes, good evening. How are you doing today? Oh, great. Thank you for joining us, Justin. You're welcome. Um, yeah, I guess Patty asked me to uh, go over, it's kind of our uh, yearly um, uh, check up or, or uh, basically um, let you know what we did in 2020, kind of our year in review, a um, little different this year, not, don't have a, uh, a PowerPoint, although I see Patty put some things together there for us to look at. Um, but uh, Justin, I can I interrupt really quick? You bet. Um, are you guys seeing just the slides or are you seeing my screen where I have all the other godly gook. I apologize for this, but I'm trying to do the full page view and, oh, I think I saw it. full screen mode. Yep. Yeah, we're just seeing the screen. We're not seeing, I'm not seeing the godly gook. Yeah, we, there were yeah. The, some of the side icons there. on the side, yeah. But now we're just That's... seeing the presentation screen. All right, thank you. This will be a meeting of patience, <laughs> so 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 please don't. Sorry, uh, Justin. Yep, for all of us. So go ahead, Justin. Sorry about that. No problem. Not a, not a problem there. But um, well, as you all know, it was a very challenging year for uh, a lot of people, um, especially in the parks and recreation, um, with the influx of users in the park and everybody looking for something to do. We uh, had a lot and a lot of new visitors, which was exciting, but also challenging at the same time. Um, one of the major challenges we did have this year is, is uh, kind of starting everything late, uh, about a month late, actually. Um, a lot of our seasonal staff um, that I hire in April, I did, did not hire till May or June. And um, uh, the ones that, that was on the golf course side and then the park side, I did not, you know, hire any park side staff until June and July. So uh, that kind of just snowballs all the way through summer. And, and uh, but I feel we did really good um, for the tasks we did accomplish. And, and um, everybody was a great team player and, and being safe. And when they were out there using the precautions they needed to do um, in order to keep themselves safe and the public safe. So um, just for some highlights uh, for the, um, you know, the amount of people, as you can see some pictures there, uh, the two on the left, um, those are at Murphy Hanrahan one day when Brian, my supervisor and I um, were rolling through there. That was in the middle of the week, like uh, I do believe a Wednesday or a Thursday. Um, oh. They were parking out on the road. That's how many people. And that was during the, the um, I guess it would be the second two weeks of the pandemic uh, stay at home orders. And um, so that's, that's how busy it was. Of course, kids in the middle there were finding uh, exciting things to do, um, hanging in trees very high, which was interesting to see. And um, the other slide there is just, uh, I do believe at a Cleary Park there. Um, I've never seen in my 22 years of uh, working for the park district, um, the park that busy for a full two weeks um, every day, uh, especially on a lot of those gorgeous afternoons uh, or even mornings, it was it was back to back people walking on the trails and and so on and so forth. So, um, just kind of another tidbit. Um, I generally go through uh, forty cases of dog mm -hmm. um, uh, poo bags, so to speak. Um, I, this year I went over 40 cases. That's that's over 80,000 bags that we went through this year in our three dog parks. So um, they were very highly visited. 
um, along with uh, the golf course. Generally, we do 15,000 rounds. Um, this year, we did 25,000 rounds of golf. Uh, a lot of new people taking up the, uh, the sport of golf. So it was fun to see, but also very challenging to try and take care of the course. And um, with all the new, new people learning how to swing a club and so on and so forth. So um, I guess, Patty, would you like me to touch on uh, some of the projects um, we accomplished in 2021? Or 2020. 2020. Sorry. Yep, 2020. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, just to highlight some of the projects we did at uh, Cleary Lake, um, we were able to continue with the uh, campground rehab. Uh, we got a couple of 60s installed late fall of 2020. A um, little challenging on one of them there. I, the, we had to ba basically back a full size. Um, semi truck um, through a very tight quarter, um, but eventually we got it. I think we ended up being there till about nine, 10 o'clock at night in order to lift it off and put it on its foundation. But um, that was that was a fun fun project there. Um, and then you know finishing the landscaping in um, the spring, we were able to do that. So, Madam Chair. <clears throat> I just wanted to clarify something I because the park commissioners may not know a CXT are the vault latrines. Yes. Just wanted to clarify because that was a big project, a really big, big, big project that they took on. Um, those are associated with the campground at Cleary yep. and, the, and other um, activities. Yep. Um, of course, the exciting uh, project for Cleary Lake was uh, the new shop opening we were finally able to uh, occupy it in July. So uh, that was a little bit of a challenge getting some seasonals on and then not having a shop to uh, actually house them in. Um, but but uh, it's been a great, great asset to our team. Um, we are constantly uh, finding ways to utilize it to its fullest and we greatly appreciate that project getting done. Um, it's, it's definitely been uh, very helpful in our, in our system. Um, Cleary Golf, we did some rehab, what I call rehab of fairways. Um, basically, do very extensive aeration. Um, then we actually pick up the cores off the fairways. Um, top dress put sand inside those holes there and then we seed and, and uh, fertilize. And uh, number five was one of our big areas. We were having some trouble with that one last couple of summers because of the dense clay soils, um, water issue, watering issues and so on and so forth. So that was one we hit this year and it turned out really well. Uh, we also did parts of number four, eight, nine sections of it of those fairways, we did that same process and we could really tell a difference in the, in the uh, uh, quality of grass after those, um, after those areas were done. And we do plan on in 2021 to do a few more fairways like that, just to continue helping out those fairways since there's such a high clay um, dense soil. Um, we also, this winter, we were doing a bunch of uh, tree rehab, uh, basically dead tree removals um, that we've just gotten behind in those the last few uh, winters. So, so we were able with this nice fall, especially into December, we were able to get a lot of that work done this year um, or last year um, in December. So um, at Murphy, um, we did install a new entry gate off of the uh, 44 intersection, uh, kind of where we had that dumping happen to us where we never did have a gate there. Um, we're trying out a new um, system where we have one larger gate for equipment and then one smaller gate that we can open and close. Um, the horse people seem to, uh, horse users um, seem to really like the system um, instead of having just the bigger gate, which they have to go at a 45 degree angle in order to get through. Um, this way, the way we have it set up now is, is to go, 
you can go straight through it at a 90 degree angle, which, which uh, really helps, um, uh, you know, the, the horse not be so uh, rattled when they come up to a gate. So um, we plan on doing a few more of those since it was uh, very successful and, and uh, plan on doing um, those hope maybe one or two more in 21. We'll, we'll see what time brings. Um, caught up on some uh, gravel lot repair um, at Murphy, which really need to happen. Um, still gonna work on that in 21. And then uh, down at Cedar, um, turf trail still continue to add sections of gravel along that. Um, the, the, the soils there just are not um, letting us have a decent trail without, without a lot of mud. So we're, we're just continuing continuing putting that gravel surface down in, in small sections as uh, we're, we're able to do it, weather allowing us to do it. Um, we did paint boat rental down there. Um, that is one building um, that uh, definitely uh, we got to look at replacement some someday when hopefully it gets a little busier down there. Um, obviously being an original building down there, it's, it's uh, got a wood frame bottom and all that kind of thing. So we're taking care of it as much as we can in order to keep it going. Um, the other big project down at Cedar we did was um, a contractor project was the fence line all around the compound fence. Um, that's been really nice, been able, especially during the pandemic there where I didn't, I wasn't able to have any staff down there. Um, we were able to lock uh, that up and, and have that area secured. And uh, that was, that was definitely helpful. Um, I didn't have to worry about uh, things um, or trailers or anything walking away during that time. Um, Spring Lake Park NRM uh, site cleanup, number one site. It's uh, kind of by the hiking trail head there. If, if you go out on the trails, it's if you would go straight at the T and walk into the woods, that's pretty much where that site is at. Uh, um, Jake and his uh, team was able to get a lot of brush piles put up and actually burned here this last winter. Um, and uh, just did a lot of NRM uh, upkeep in those areas. That was the area we actually planted a lot of trees in there and those are doing very well um, because of that upkeep. Um, some other little things down at Doyle with doing again, some brush removal and, and just some upkeep on some of our NRM sites. And, um, and uh, the Pipcorn shed has is, is, uh, been cleaned up. The, uh, we do have the one shed down there that we're utilizing for winter storage right now, uh, which has been very nice. We put a new door in there just to secure it a little bit better and it's been working out well. I do believe that house is being, uh, it's, they started taking it apart down there um, here this, uh, this winter, just a couple of weeks ago actually. Um, Blakely, we're, we're always down there and doing some uh, property care, just kind of watching that other property that uh, will be dismantled here also. And then some hazard tree removal around the, the sheds at the um, um, Wells Fargo house. Um, we just There's some vegetation that was growing into the metal there. We we're just trying to get that vegetation away so, the, so it doesn't wear off the, uh, the metal and such. So. Um, Contractor work that was done at um, in uh, 2020. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned the shop fence at Cedar, but um, some other things we were able to get done was uh, the floorings in our CXT all needed to be um, recovered and rehabbed. Um, I was able to get all of them but one this last year. Um, We'll, uh, we'll get the contractor back, uh, mainly because of weather is why we didn't get that last one. It started to rain and, and sleet on us when he was doing it. So, um, but we'll get the last one done here this summer. Um, other than that, I guess that's pretty much highlights for, for 2020. Um, any questions or anything? So I'm just going to, quickly 
go around and just call everybody's name real quick. I just want everybody to have a chance to participate. Um, Kristen, anything? No, I really appreciate the thorough. I've been reading along with the document you provided, and it's. I really appreciate all that information. You bet. Kathy? Yeah, I've been reading along too. A very good, nice summary. And I see that the 21, it looks like a lot of things just carry over from year to year, perhaps. We move on, we'll, we'll move on to 21 next. I do have one question. What's a Mike House? <laughs> the Mike House, it says Mike House Rehab. Uh, Milk House Rehab, that's probably a spelling error. My, my, my bad. I was named after this, someone. <laughs> this is the uh, internal list that I use basically for my staff. Um, generally, oh, my staff is the only one that sees this list, so I don't uh, go over it with a fine tooth comb. They know what I mean most of the time. So, yeah. No, really good. Thanks for the summary. It really was instructive. You bet. And Jerry, do you have anything? I have a question. Um, I'm interested what the first time park users, what was their comments? What was their questions? You know, we're trying to get more people in our parks. Maybe we can learn something from these people. Why weren't they using our park earlier? So, so maybe some of the questions or some of the comments I had might be helpful for us to study. Okay, this group wasn't, you know, we, we have, we've got to reach out to this group or that group, or, or maybe there's, maybe we won't learn nothing from this and whoever comes, comes. Yeah, um, a lot of the comments I had were I, you know, I knew this was here, but so busy in my life doing other things, just never had the time to come here. I uh, heard that a few times. Um, you know, the the other comment I got uh, was uh, um, I thought I had to pay to to come here, so I never bothered to come. Um, that's still out there for whatever reason. Um, but yeah, it definitely, and it got a lot of good comments, like, like how clean it was and, and how, you know, wonderful the facilities were, even though, unfortunately, we weren't able to give them the full experience because a lot of them weren't open, um, for quite a few weeks, actually. So, um, but yeah. Okay. Thank you. You bet. All right, just checking to see if uh, Eric has any comments. You know, I always have a few. I know, um, that's okay. <laughs> so, hey, Justin, I've been over at uh, Murphy Hanrahan a few different times throughout this fall. seems like there's been a lot more walkers back there. I noticed one section of Razorback that was, I don't know if it was like flooded and there's some trees down. Are there plans going forward for like maybe calendar year 21 to fix some of these areas to help bring them up so they're not flooded or um, they're not obstacles for people that are hiking back there? Yes, there is. Um, we actually started started working on this here in September uh, when things slow down a little bit for me. Um, they've been flooded now for the last two summers. Um, I was hoping this summer they would dry out enough to where, okay, we can open them back up in the fall and, and be done with it. But it seems like the weather patterns or just the area itself um, is not going to do that. So um, did start talking to a lot of people. Unfortunately, there's a lot of players that have to come into um, uh, come into the conversation when you, um, you know, look at um, moving a trail, basically, that's the only um, option for us in this area. Um, the, the areas that got flooded um, or are flooded are actually a couple of um, listed wetland areas on the National Wetland Inventory. Um, so it's not like we can just go fill them and build a trail through them. Um, they were made a long time ago and and so uh, over the years, you know, they've they've gotten to the point to where, okay, we need to, uh, a lot of the trails over at Murphy, we just need to um, rehab. And so the plan is um, right now we were, uh, 
we were working with the county to get some permitting uh, in order to uh, install a new trail. We have actually a route already designated. Um, I've had my forestry players, uh, my water quality, um, um, and then ma other maintenance people involved. And uh, then I got some of the county people involved. And uh, now with the township going to a city that the, the uh, the county actually said, well, now it's under their just jurisdiction to um, give you permits. So now I'm back talking with them um, as far as what we need for permits and that's where it's at right now. I'm waiting on answers for that. And um, that's where it sits. I, I do have, and I, I have people ready. Um, actually, I, have some funding ready to hire a contractor to get it done if we can't get it done. Um, actually, uh, forestry and us, uh, we would have probably, if I would have gotten the permits here with the county, we would have had it cleared of trees um, in December when we had that gorgeous stretch of weather. Um, unfortunately, we just couldn't get uh, communication or whatever was going on there. Um, and, and, and so um, we got, you know, we got held up on that. Now it has snowed and, and we're just going to keep it closed now for the winter. Um, and hopefully maybe this winter we can get back there and remove the trees so that we're ready to grade here come spring. So. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Because I know I've seen a couple of reports on Skinny Ski where people actually like skiing back there. You know, yeah. they want to do the back country. I am always worried that someone's going to fall and hurt themselves going over some of those trees, but um, yeah, but, but that's good. You guys have a plan going forward, right? I, there's been so many people at our parks on the trail systems. It's just unbelievable. So yep. Yep. it's hard to keep up with all the different projects going on. Right. Yeah. And then just to clarify, Justin, you were talking about um, the township moving to the city. And so you're talking about Credit River Township is incorporating into a city, correct? Correct. Yeah. And, and so that's basically all of the, the land between Murphy, Hanrahan, and um, Cleary. Yep, yep. Yep. And I, I think I just saw a, a, an article that they will be electing a, a city council and a mayor in the spring. Right. Yeah, in March, evidently, is when they're going to do their uh, elections. Yep. All right. Thank you. Just okay. to double check here, um, Patrick, do you have anything? Uh, no, nothing. Thank you, Justin, for the presentation and also for the great work that you and your team have been doing over the year. You're welcome. Mark, is there anything you'd like to add or ask Justin about? Nope, I'm good to go. Again, like everyone else, thanks for the uh, presentation, Justin. You bet. Commissioner Ulrich, is there anything that you would like to add? Uh, no, no, there isn't. Uh, no, a very good right. presentation. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, I, I too uh, appreciate the thoroughness of both the work that your team does and and coming and sharing this information with the with the commission. We um, look forward to it every year and very interested in um, what is happening in the parks from a maintenance perspective as always. Um, does anybody else, Patty or anybody else have any other comments before we move on on the agenda items? Nope, just thank you, Justin, for always being willing to share with us. It's greatly appreciated. You bet. All right, we're gonna move on to our next agenda item which is item number 6B, Prairie Stewardship Update. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so we, um, staff wanted to take a moment and kind of reflect on some projects we've been doing at Doyle Kennefick. We've had, um, over the last 10 years, three phases of kind of large grant um, projects that have, have involved many different community partners and, those have all sort of come to a close here 
at the end of 2020. Um, we, we still actually are just um, ending a different grant that I'll um, wrap up, I think, mid-year in 2021. Um, but for our really big grants that um, we started planning for back in 2009, a lot of those are coming to a close. And we thought it might be nice just to kind of reflect on those, talk a little bit about how that work has transitioned over time. Um, and we also wanted to uh, point out some of the uh, or the philosophy we've taken over the years. And I think some of the commissioners that who have been on the pack for a number of years might remember some of these conversations, but we wanted to mention um, sort of our philosophy of when we take on new um, land stewardship or restoration projects um, and talk a little bit about the success. And then we also wanted you to know that we'll be, we're just about um, looking for what's the next phase um, in terms of needs at um, Doyle Kennefic and um, how we might actually um, meet those needs. Um, so generally speaking, our active uh, management that we've been doing since really starting in about 2009 um, primarily has occurred in that um, inside that sort of hot pink um, polygon on the aerial photo to your, to your right there. And I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, so when we um, started working at um, the park, actually, I'm going to go back just real quick here. When we started doing our active management there in 2009, some of you may remember the area that's in the top third of that polygon. Um, that was a crop field, and it's a 54-acre site that we worked, um, the parks and the highway department worked to restore to prairie um, and wetlands. And that site is um, pretty much finished with our real intense sort of establishment phase. And we refer to that as the management we do there is sort of this general um, land stewardship. The rest of the site south of that, um, the gravel road that runs east-west here, this is really the projects that we've tackled since about 2013 in those three different phases that I just mentioned of really sort of intensive natural resource work with different partners. Um, and back before 2009, when we started um, building our capacity to start really caring for the land there, we um, decided that we needed to be really strategic um, we wanted to make sure that we were really inclusive and in making connections with the community and all of our work. And it was really important that we made sure that once we started down the road of active management there that our program was sustainable. So what we mean by being strategic is really from the very beginning, we worked with our partners to not just implement, but to plan um, and to use available resource inventories and surveys and to work with our partners to get inventories when we, had, we didn't have them so that we had a, bear, a better understanding of where our real sensitive resources at the park. Um, and then we always from the beginning looked at which um, projects, natural resource projects, um, have the most uh, benefits. So where will we find multiple benefits if we do a project and which ones have the highest impact? So an example of really high impact would be taking a really degraded part piece of land like like row crops um, and doing a complete um, restoration into a woodland in, or into a prairie. And a, a project that would have multiple benefits might be um, if we um, restored some cropland or um, some degraded land that um, um, by restoring it, we removed some phosphorus running off and that helped the WMO, for instance, the Scott Watershed Management Organization, meet some of their phosphorus removal goals for a watershed. Um, so we're very strategic um, in thinking through our priorities. Um, and from the beginning, we've wanted to, because Doyle Kennefix, similar to um, Blakely, isn't fully open for use, um, we've taken the opportunity of these projects to connect people to the site. So we're building connections for the neighbors and the community to the land. We're um, offering volunteer opportunities through all the different projects. Um, and we really see it as a way to build community um, through the work. Um, and in terms of being having a sustainable program, we have um, really set what we see as a responsible pace. Um, I think we'd always love to do a little bit more. 
Um, but we don't want to find ourselves in a situation where we're tackling, you know, really exciting restoration projects, but suddenly they're failing because we don't have the resources to maintain them. It's really tempting in the restoration world. Um, and I've seen it happen in other locations where you think, oh, well, let's just do a little more buckthorn at that park or this park. Um, and if you, if you don't have a plan to come back, um, if you, um, well, and if you're tempted by just um, sort of the shiny new big project, you can really get yourself in trouble. Um, you can put a lot of chemical on the ground. You can have a lot of volunteers do a lot of work. You can do a lot of work with your crews. And then 10 years later, it all goes to waste. So we really do put a lot of work into being, having a responsible pace. We have had partners come forward and maybe it's to their benefit to do a project with us. Um, but if, we, if there's no reasonable um, um, ability for us to maintain it, we, we've taken a pass. And I think we do a pretty good job at that. We also really pay attention to what are the planned amenities at a park. So we know that um, at Doyle Kennefic, um, you know, there's, lar there's areas where we will have infrastructure. And so we're thoughtful about the, the type of pro land stewardship project we might do, especially if grants are involved um, or restoration, um, because we don't want to do that work and then um, um, have to rip it out, for instance. Um, uh, we don't always know, so we don't let that um, completely stop us, but we do give a lot of thought to that. So now the fun part. Um, so the results that that polygon area that I showed you just a minute ago, that represents 150 acres. Um, so starting in about 2009, we started planning a lot of this. And today we have some really, really nice um, savanna area to some beginnings of woodland. Um, we have some restored wetlands and as you know, quite a bit of prairie. Um, we're actively managing all of that. It's in different phases. Um, but we've also, through all that work, been able to have dozens of volunteer events. Um, Great River Greening has been very helpful in that. We've worked with, you might remember, um, the Minnesota Waterfall Association, the New Market Sportsman's Conservationist Club. Um, we worked with, the, actually, the SMSC was involved at one point. They had their big chip route on site. Some of you might remember that. Um, and obviously, um, we worked to continue those partnerships and, and relationships. Um, the pictures on the bottom there, I think those, all three of those are from 2018. Um, there's a little bit of a kind of a woodland um, uh, wildlife uh, plot, food plot there um, along uh, 23. Um, so that the, on the very, the bottom right there, you see people planting shrubs and trees. Not only is that habitat, we designed um, to put a little bit of a, a woodland there to help buffer the road from what will be a future hiking trail in that area. Um, and then that middle picture, I'm pretty sure that is the oak woodland area that um, surrounds uh, the, the wetlands that are real close to the homestead. And then the upper right, um, you can see the photo of lupin. There was one lone lupin plant in the in the, our very northern prairie, that 54 acre prairie. Alyssa and I were out, I think early, I think it was this May, and we happened upon that plant. Um, and then there's a, below that lupin is a picture of, actually that's Alyssa um, out in the middle of that prairie. Um, so I, I think it's just really, I think the county and the park commission, everyone should be really proud. It's a, a lot of um, care that we put into the site and I know I'm really pleased. Um, so looking forward, we'll continue our active, what we kind of refer to as our active general stewardship. You know, that means uh, prescribed burns, haying, uh, monitoring for noxious weeds and treating as we see those. Um, and we'll still have some targeted stewardship areas in that lower sort of two thirds. Um, some of those areas are still considered a little bit new, so they're still really establishing. Um, I think there's an opportunity to do some good work in our um, expanding out of that polygon in the forest area. Um, and we'll be reaching out to some of our partners and reviewing what um, our priorities should be. Um, 
and thinking through our capacity um, as well as what other grant funds might be out there for, uh, for the county to match. Um, so we'll give some thought to that this year, um, thinking through, I think the, there's some conservation partners legacy grants, which we've been pretty successful with that come out in September and December. Um, so this would be us planning this year, looking towards next year. Um, and certainly we will be back to talk to the Park Commission too about the different potential priorities. Um, but an immediate next step um, that we have related to the grant that we're just going to be finishing up next year that Alyssa has been um, coordinating over the last couple of years um, is the this volunteer seating event, which I think we mentioned in the last couple of meetings, but I thought we could um, provide a little bit of an update on where that's at. And I'll have Alyssa step in and chat with you about that. And then I'm, I'm happy to maybe after Alyssa um, shares about that, I'm happy to take questions um, about any of the, the work that I've just talked about. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Patty. Um, yeah, so we are having a volunteer event. Um, it's actually, a, well, I volunteer day. Um, it's occurring on February 20th um, with the idea of doing a winter seating activity. And when I've told people about this, I've gotten a lot of questions about it. Like, why would you go seed in the winter? Um, and it's actually a methodology that um, you can mix the seed with the sand and kind of toss it over the snow. And as the snow melts, it creates um, a little spot in the soil for the seed to kind of nestle itself into. Um, so it's actually effective. And it's a great way to get people out into the into the prairie area when it's not necessarily a popular time. Um, so the uh, volunteer opportunity is occurring, like I said, on uh, February 20th, Justin has been super helpful um, helping me organize that. Um, we've had, because of COVID, it makes creating a volunteer opportunity a little bit more challenging. Um, it has to be structured in a way that isn't promoting a lot of gathering, isn't, um, we have to definitely keep COVID restrictions in mind. So I have been working on ways to try and do that. And we have a few staff leads, including uh, Madam Chair uh, Barb Hedstrom, who are going to be uh, present at the event to kind of help lead pods of no more than three households um, so that we don't um, overstep that gathering limit. And as of now, we have eight households who have indicated that they are interested in volunteering at the event. I've been doing sign up via household because that's the greatest limiting factor. Um, and it also is a nice opportunity because when I'm responding to interested residents, they are encouraged to bring their families um, as opposed to perhaps signing up just as an individual. Um, so I definitely have multiple family members who are coming out to volunteer together and everyone seems really excited about the opportunity. Um, other than that, um, it should, we're hoping for some good weather and not some super cold weather like we're going to get this weekend. Um, but it should be a great opportunity to get people outside, get people at Joel Kennefick. And um, seating is a really great volunteer opportunity because you kind of know what's gonna, you can drive by later on when things are pretty. And if it, the, and if, you know, the prairie looks good, you're like, oh, I helped do that. So it's kind of a nice rewarding uh, volunteer event that isn't super strenuous, um, isn't super long, um, but will hopefully be super successful. And this is a part of our uh, CPL grant that I've mentioned before. Great, thank you, Alyssa, and welcome. I, we appreciate that, and another shout out to Justin for his help in, in helping with that. Um, I'm gonna um, just start off and then go around to everybody to see if they have any questions on any of these two items we've discussed, but I'll start off. Um, Alyssa, do you have a, num a goal number of, of households that you're looking for, or um, you mentioned we have eight, what are you hoping for? Yeah, so thank you so much, Madam Chair, for that um, that question. I really did not know what to expect when trying to plan some sort of volunteer opportunity for COVID. I think eight households is great. Um, I'm super happy that, I mean, I was going to be happy with like one or two households that wanted to come out and seed. Um, but so eight households is, um, I'm super excited about it. Um, there's also a possibility for more. Um, I was definitely um pushing back on some of the extreme interest of some individuals who knew a lot of individuals that wanted to do it just because of COVID reasons and wanting to make sure that we could keep things within protocols. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm really happy. And I think that 
you know, if we were to hold another seating event, maybe in the fall, um, and perhaps with COVID restrictions a little bit different, I don't have any doubt that we couldn't pull together a larger group. If, a larger group. Yeah, if gathering, mm -hmm. gatherings were allowed. Excellent, thank you. So um, with, if, with time allowing, I'm just gonna call on everybody real quick. I want them to have an opportunity. So Kirsten, Kristen, do you have anything? I do not. Hearing? not. Okay. I, I know. I got it now. I do not. I I think I'm really pleased to see the prairie seating. I think that's a whole new idea, and I'm glad to hear that there's interest in it. All right, and then just real quickly, Kathy. No, I got nothing, but I too am very interested in this. Um, they've done quite a bit of this type of thing. I live right on the boundary of the Medwakanton, and it's, it's nice to see the native grasses come back up. It's really, really a nice result. Um, how many more volunteers do you need for the eight families that you've got so far? Just one more, or... Alyssa? Um, yes, yeah, sorry. So can you, um, I have any more, I don't think we need any more volunteers. Okay. I'm having them sign up as households just because of the three household gathering limit. Um, not necessarily, there's a 15 person limit, but we're not going to, the households that are signing up are not households of eight people. So it's not something that we're um, struggling with. So um, we have, I have capacity to have more households sign up at this point based off of um, the staff I have available, but I wouldn't say that we need other people because I believe that we can get the work that we want to get done accomplished with the amount of people that have signed up. Oh, that's cool. That's a gr great way to get around COVID too. have people sign up as families. That's smart. Love that idea. Nope, All right. I don't have and, great. And then just uh, to try to keep on schedule, I just, but I do want to check Jerry and then Eric will be on deck. Do you guys have any comments? I'm, I'm glad that Doyle Kenefick is, well, we kind of forget about that, but I'm glad things are progressing there and you know, we're taking baby steps, but things are moving. That's great. Yep, and I agree with Jerry as well. You know, it's, it's gonna be nice to get more people into this park. A lot of people go to Cleary, Murphy, Spring Lake, mm -hmm. right? Cedar, it'd be nice to show off this park as well as Blakely. Yeah. Pat, Mark? Yeah, this is Pat. Um, I just wanna uh, say thank you for the uh, update um, on what's happening at Doyle Kennefix since it has been a while since we've talked much about it. And also congratulations to Alyssa for being very creative and finding a way to do this volunteer event and stay within the COVID guidelines. Good work. Mm -hmm. Mark, do you have any comments? No comments or questions, Madam Chair. Great, thank you. And Commissioner? Uh, no questions. Commissioner Orange, great, thank you. Uh, moving ahead, um, we're just slightly behind schedule and that's my fault, I'm quite sure. But um, Pat, we're gonna move on to our next agenda item, number eight, and that would be Miriam Junction Trail Design. Patty? Hi, thanks Madam Chair. Um, and I wanna mention that we have Craig Jensen, and he turned his camera on. Hi, Craig. Craig is with the Scott County Transportation Department and we've worked together for quite a few years. Um, and Craig and um, Lisa Fries, some of you know, are really great um, trail advocates. And we work um, really quite a bit together to make sure we're taking care of our trails, doing better with connectivity, et cetera, et cetera. Craig is the official project manager for the Miriam Junction Trail. He's kind of dragged me kicking and screaming <laughs> into kind of being co-project co manager. Um, and he and I are both gonna together cover cover this. Craig, do you want to, um, before I jump in, do you want to just say hello or um, say anything else? Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, Craig Jensen. I am the Transportation Planning Manager uh, at Scott County and um, excited. Also, the project manager, as Patty mentioned, and excited to be working on this. All right. Um, 
so jumping into this, we ha I have mentioned the last few months that we have um, formed a team that's working with SRF, a consulting for firm, to um, help us better understand what the potential cost will be to construct the Miriam um, Junction Regional Trail. The project management team consists of um, Scott County Public Works folks, Craig, as well as um, Jake Bulk, who's a construction manager, myself, um, Minnesota DNR. We have the park director from Carver County Parks, and we have the um, a city of Carver representative, Erin. I or I'm yeah, Erin. I think she's the maybe the community development director. Hopefully, I'm not getting that um, wrong. Craig, am, am I missing anyone on that? Other than SRF, I think you covered it. Okay, um, as I've mentioned, the 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 whole point of the project is to come up with a preliminary design and cost estimates. There are a few um, issues we are working through together um, that we wanted to make the pack aware of, um, give you an opportunity to sort of ask questions, um, hear sort of what we're struggling with and what we're um, working through, get your feedback. Um, these all revolve around the fact that the trail is, um, you know, it's in a, a river floodplain, a major river. Um, it's an environmentally challenging location. Um, there's uh, very nearby other public um, recreation infrastructure that we're taking into consideration. I want to chat a little bit about um, trail uses. And at this point, I'm actually going to um, switch. I'm going to stop sharing this um, presentation and switch to a different screen. So just bear with me. All right, just one sec here. And while she's doing that, I just gonna take this moment to comment. In case you haven't noticed, I'm trying to give everybody a time and a space to ask questions and give some feedback. And so kind of, we'll just call on everybody um, you don't have to provide any feedback, but um, mindful of time, I just wanna have everybody the opportunity to, to ask a question in an, in an orderly manner. To, um, especially with these Zoom meetings, I think sometimes you, yeah, people can get overlooked, so. Okay, Patty, are you ready for us? Uh, I don't see about, anything new on your screen yet. I know, I need about 10 more seconds here, just a sec. Oh, stretch it out, fill it out, is that what you're telling me to do? <laughs> Where is it? There it is. Hopefully this will work here. There we go. Thank you. Now I have to move you guys, your faces. Okay. Some of this might look familiar to you. Um, we have shared this a little bit before. Can you see my cursor as well? Yes. Okay. So here's the project area. So here's city of Carver. Um, here's the Minnesota River. Um, this is the former rail bed. We have connecting trail that's built over right over here. This is a Carver County Regional Trail. This here is um, trail that's been built that someday will be a regional, will be the regional, uh, excuse me, regional connection. Mm -hmm. um, I think you know we are looking at a major um, river crossing, so that we'll need a Minnesota River Bridge and then other um, bridges to accommodate youth here. Um, the, uh, just a sec here. Oh, I thought the Minnesota Valley State Trail was shown on here. Oh, there it is, okay. Um, you can see that this brown line here, this is the state trail and as it, um, comes into Chaska, it turns into a natural surface trail and it comes real close to what will be our Miriam Junction Trail. Um, so one of the things that we're looking at is um, how does this trail interact with the state trail? You may have um, been reminded from the materials that we sent out in the packet that the Miriam Junction Trail, as we ma master plan that back in 2011, um, the identified uses, uh, multi-use trail, 
um, hiking, biking, um, uh, winter walking, that kind of thing. Um, and we specifically reviewed the nearby use of this trail having equestrian use, um, hiking, walking, snowmobiles, informal cross-country skiing, it's not groomed. Um, and uh, in, also in this area, um, because it's in the river floodplain, you can imagine um, there's wetlands. I mean, the entire, the entire river floodplains is considered a wetland. And um, part of the trail in this area right now, um, there's actually been quite a bit of a erosion. So we're dealing with you know, a bit of an active eroding um, site, uh, uh, periodic flooding, um, wetland impacts if we go outside of the current footprint of the trail. So, um, you know, nothing terribly surprising. These are things that we worked through when we did the master plan too. But now that we're in the design phase, we're getting down to the nitty gritty of what does this all mean? Um, and one of the things we first want to chat about is the flooding issue. Um, so the current um, part of what SRF is doing is looking at um, the current elevation of what was the rail bed. And at that elevation, looking at history, so the last 10, 12 years, um, how many flood events would have happened at the trail um, at that elevation. And we, um, uh, and I think, and Craig helped me, is that right now, I, I think they haven't finished their analysis, but we believe the current elevation of the old rail line is probably at about um, the 25 year, or no, I'm not saying that right. It's, will you help me out on that one, how we wanted to describe? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's uh, uh, the 25 year flood event or flood elevation um, is where the existing rail bed is at. Um, and you know, I think one part of the analysis, and like, I'm just going to step in, Patty, is we're looking at not only the 25, but maybe what it would be at the at the 50 year, because they actually looked at 10, uh, 25, and 50. Um, but the overall analysis, I think we chose to do the 25 because it's pretty close to the existing, and then going out to the 50 year uh, kind of flood flood event, and uh, seeing how many times would that trail uh, potentially be uh, uh, overtopped by the floodwaters. Thank you. You said it way better than I could have. Um, and we don't have exact numbers right now, but um, we believe, for instance, that at, a t at the 25-year um, elevation, um, that there could have been as many as, I think it was like 50 to 60 flooded days over a 10 year period. So if we look at just the actual data of the last, I think it was 10 years. And um, we said, okay, we're gonna, um, we're gonna look at the existing elevation. It would have been flooded 50 to 60 times in that 10 year, um, in that 10 year period. And it, what we're trying to figure out is if we build it, um, I think a foot higher, how many flooded days would we expect to see? Certainly if we built it, you know, five feet higher, there'd be very, very few. But anytime that you're going above the current elevation, obviously there's a cost, um, just construction costs that go up. But then you're also, um, you're using more of the space up. So you end up having environmental costs like mitigation. Um, so when you think about it, this trail um, in some instances is close to, I guess what we would consider somewhat steep, steep slopes. And at the edge of the trail, you know, you want a gradual slope. And the higher a trail would be built up in this environment, you suddenly get the corridor wider because you need those, those slopes. So um, there's several different variables at play here. There's the actual cost of construction, and then the bigger the project gets, the environmental costs go up. 
Um, and then certainly um, having a, um, a larger infrastructure footprint in a um, on Minnesota uh, DNR lands, um, you know, is is not you know something we look at at lightly. Um, I believe the um, ana that hydrology analysis they'll be working on over the the coming weeks, and we'll have um, an update either at the April or the May meeting, probably April. Um, one thing we're looking at and seeking input from the Department of Natural Resources is um, what are what are some standard practices around um, when a trail in this type of situation would be proactively closed in a flooding event. So do you wait until the water is actually on the trail surface? Um, do you monitor it? And if the floodwaters come up and they're a foot below the trail surface, is that when you close it? Um, and interestingly, the DNR, um, uh, that the feedback we've received from the DNR is that in their, in their cases where they have state trail by a river and they gave the Bloomington stretch um, as an example on the mm -hmm. Minnesota River, that they just wait until water is actually on top of the trail. So um, uh, what we had been hearing from our consultants, um, SRF, is that there's typically a spot where an agency might say, we're going to say at X, and, you know, X elevation, um, if water comes up and it's two feet close, um, two feet below the top of the trail, that's when we'll decide our practice is that a trail is closed down. Um, and we were expecting to hear that the DNR had some guidelines on that, and we have just not heard anything. So one of the things we're doing, and Craig is going to follow up um, internally at the county, is to look into are there existing practices that we have um, that can inform what we would um, recommend here. And some of that will inform what the, um, the ultimate design is. Um, so that's one of the big issues we're dealing with is um, what's the right elevation? And obviously, like, like I just mentioned, um, actual dollar costs and environmental costs are considerations. Um, and then uh, what will be the days that we'll project for flooding at those different elevations? Um, Craig, on that, on the flooding issue or the trail elevation um, or the practice for the, the freeboard, do you want to add anything? Um, you know, I guess, yeah, that's one thing we're just going to have to look at because um, I don't, with the flowing, I mean, the floodwaters that will come up slowly, but you're still up against adjacent to a, a flowing river. Um, so I don't know that we would necessarily wait till it's over the top to close it, especially with some bridges in the area. Um, you could have debris coming down and, and you don't want to have people on those bridges when it's floodwaters that could impact the bridge as well. So those are things we just have to think through and, and work on and, and really come up with a, the right elevation uh, so that we understand not only the, the cost to build this stuff, but that those future uh, you know, potential impacts as well for the environment, the wetlands, as Patty mentioned. Um, you know, so we have to, it's all really all a balancing act that we really need to kind of to kind of work through on this uh, design effort. Um, before we move on to sort of the other public infrastructure at the site and sort of what we're thinking there, um, does the Park Commission have any have any questions or just comments about the the flooding issue and elevation? Um, yeah, I'll go ahead and start um, and then we'll just go around to everybody again quickly. Um, I've actually spent quite a bit of time along um, the river right in Car on the Carver side. And I'm always amazed at the huge, huge trees that are floating in the river and going yeah. downstream. And so when you talk about, you know, um, concern about safety on the bridge and along the shoreline, um, I think that's an, a very important point because I, I see it and I'm like, we're, we haven't even had rain. I don't know where these trees are coming from or washing out from. But as you know, that whole river is, is very unstable from a bank perspective. And so I think there's, we can't think of it just in the spring flooding time that there's debris 
in that river because I, I think there's a lot of debris um, during other times of the year also. So that's my comment and then I'll just go around everybody real quick again starting off with Kristen. I don't have anything to add right now. Great thank you Kathy. No I have nothing to add. Thank Great you. thank you. Jerry. I have two questions. Um, is this in the U.S. Fish and Wildlife territory or property? Uh, Madam Chair and Commissioner Hennon, it is nearby and I'm just about to go over sort of the lay of the land in terms of ownership. It's primarily on um, DNR parks land, parks and okay. trails land, but so there's a little bit of interaction with wildlife, yes. Okay, so we don't need the U.S. Fish and Wildlife to okay anything on here or should they be at the table? Um, they are at the table. Um, we need them when it comes to the parking lot that we hope to share. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Then my second question, uh, the 65 flood, was that considered a 50 year flood or a hundred year flood? Maybe you don't know the answer, but you know, I mean, when you say a 50 year flood or a 25 year, I mean, with, if I knew what the, the 65 one was, that would give me some idea of where we're coming from here. Uh, Madam Chair and Commissioners, I don't have the answer to that, but we can find it out. Now I'm really intrigued. Yeah, I don't know for sure either, but I think it was classified as a hundred year flood. Um, that's my trivial pursuit brain telling me that, but. But didn't we almost reach that a couple of years ago? Um, no, I, yes. I, yes, we did. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that would and, be. And thus, that's why they that, just. Or, would, that, would that make it a 50 year rain then? Right. And, I, and, you know, and they did just reissue um, floodplains. I know the city of Jordan just published their map with where the floodplain um, has extended to that impacts homeowners and having to get insurance. the option to get flood insurance and things like that. So that's recently been updated. Um, and I guess my other comment just quickly on that is I'm always curious to see if there's been any flooding mitigation um, after construction of um, the new bridge out of Shakopee um, that opened up a lot more land to be available for flooding and taking down that bermed road. Um, so it'll be interesting to see as years develop what impact that has. Madam Chair, yeah, it'd be interesting to, I mean, they calculate all of that. I wonder if they've mm -hmm. applied it to, I wonder who gets that. I wonder how they yeah. handle that. I do know that, well, I don't. I, Craig, that's a, that'd be an interesting question to ask. Um, although it might be considered a different subwatershed, maybe not. Um, yeah, when that? 101 went to more of a bridge rather than a bermed road. All right, we'll just move on and just real quickly. Um, Eric. Any comments or questions? No comments. I'm looking forward to the next uh, presentation talking about what they want to do with this path. So, yep. Um, Pat and Mark, just real quick. Nope, nothing at this time. All right. Um, thank um, you. And great. Thank you. Let's proceed, Patty. Um, so, just keep in mind, you know, what, what, what you think would be tolerable for number of days flooded. And I, I don't think we need to answer that now, but I, I think that that's something that we, we'll be um, wrestling with, with the project management team. Um, uh, and, uh, yeah, what, what's a tolerable amount of having a, having a trail um, flood down every year, every five years? Um, kind of a rhetorical question just to have in mind. Well, then you should probably ask the DNR, what, how many days a year does it close between Jack and Chaska on the existing trail? It seems like every year that thing is down mm -hmm. for a week or two. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, do you see the map with the different colors, the parcels mm -hmm. that are colored? Okay, so this big um, heavy red line, that's the old rail bed, and that is the alignment for the Miriam Junction Regional Trail. This mar maroon line is the Minnesota Valley State Trail. That is the natural surface trail that's hiking, snowmobiling, equestrian, etc. Because there's, 
you know, they're both public recreation amenities. Mm -hmm. um, we in DNR is at the table. Um, we have, we are contemplating as a part of this project, are there points along the corridor where the Miriam Junction project um, could help enhance the Minnesota Valley State Trail? Um, that's one thing we're looking at. So there's a couple of points where the State Trail comes close to the Minnesota Valley Trail. And, um, and in some areas, the, the State Trail floods you know, quite often. So can we, um, through our work, help lift that up at, at certain points? Um, because the Minnesota Valley Trail is an existing use, that would co not cause any issue with the approved master plan. So, what, so one piece of sort of governance here is that the Scott County and Carver County did a, a, a master plan that was approved in 2011 and approved it at Met Council. And it very specifically calls out acceptable uses and very specifically says um, no equestrian and no snowmobile use. So one of the things we're keeping an eye on is um, as we collaborate with the DNR and um, try to be responsible in terms of what is a good thing to do with the public infrastructure down here, um, are we triggering uh, opening up a master plan? And we, we are talking with Met Council Park staff. And if we were to, uh, they're very supportive of the county working with the DNR um, to potentially have mutual benefit here. So if we are able to um, help the Minnesota Valley State Trail um, at certain points be um, lifted up out of the river valley or out of the um, floodplain um, and flood not as frequently. They're very supportive of that if they're if they're if they remain separate. No one thinks that will trigger a master plan um, amendment. So just something to be aware of. In this conversation, this idea also came up from DNR. Gosh, you know, there's a lot of um, uh, are there, there isn't, there aren't a lot of great um, snowmobile crossings along the Minnesota River. And DNR asked, would we consider as a part of the project, look at what it might take to have the Minnesota River Bridge actually allow the regional trail as well as an area for the snowmobiles. Um, and so that is something that we're looking into. Um, there are also implications surrounding that. Um, on the Carver County side, there's no existing snowmobile trail system that this would um, attach to. So they would they would land and need a, a parking lot or something. Um, there's also, you know, is it something the city of Carver wants? Is that something they want to plan for and prepare for? Um, we, we did get the okay because it makes some sense to be thinking um, beyond just the regional trail. We got the okay from county leadership to have um, the consultant review at a high level, what would that mean in terms of cost? Um, and to also look at operationally how, what that would look like. It's, we're starting to see that we believe if we had um, a river crossing, crossing that allowed um, the regional trail uses, the standard regional trail uses, um, and then next to it on the same bridge, but in a separate, um, a separate part of the bridge, um, there was snowmobile traffic allowed. Um, we're thinking that it's about a 60% um, increase in cost. Um, so the, we're still looking at that. What does that mean? Um, City of Carver has not said, oh yes, for sure we want this. It's still very much in flux and in discussion. It's one of those that we felt we needed to be responsible given the amount of infrastructure um, and um, the amount of the size of the project. Um, Craig, do you have anything you wanna add on to that piece? Yeah, I mean, we looked at a wider bridge and would separate the traffic if we went to snowmobile. We feel on that a 14 foot wide bridge, you know, you're combining for over 700 feet, you're combining snowmobile use, maybe it's cross country ski use, it's it's other kinds of uses all in that same corridor. Uh, for that long, that long corridor, I guess it, we thought we'd lose, look at something that would potentially be a separated uh, trail just for snowmobile use only, uh, just for safety factors. Um, 
if we if we went that route. So that's that's kind of what we had looked at, and, and that's the sixty percent cost increase um, for the bridge. I mentioned. The yeah, and I guess I'm leaving out the standard a standard bridge size that we um, are seeing put in for regional trails. Are it's about fourteen feet wide, and certainly a fourteen foot wide trail you could not fit uh, multi-use pedestrian separated from snowmobiles. Um, and thus we looked at what size of a bridge might we need to separate those in the winter time. And that's where the consultant identified that um, going through and do, running the numbers that that size of a bridge would be about a 60% cost increase. Um, any just thoughts right now on that, on that? part of the conversation that we're, we're kick, kicking around and studying. Um, any questions? Does anybody have any comment or question that they want to start out with? Well, I have a comment. Uh, is there any way of controlling keeping non-studded or studded snowmobiles off of the bridge? I mean, they can chew up a, a trail in no time. Or maybe they're maybe they're not using studs anymore, but I think they are. Yeah, there were some ideas that were given um, on options we could look at um, to probably help with that wear on the bridge. Um, but you know, like I said, it's still early. Um, but we are definitely considering you know looking at some different options to for that. But that's got to be a question that you got to have answered before you build it you know, are snowmobiles allowed or not? And what do you put down for a surface if they are allowed? You know, you want to replace that every five years. And Madam Chair and Commissioner Hennon, um, we also, that can be managed through operations. And again, you know, it's, um, you know, operating things like that on remote trails has some challenges, but I'm, pr I'm not positive about this. And if anyone on the call is an active snowmobiler, please, um, jump in, but I think often um, studs or no studs is something that's an operational, um, it's, a, it's managed that way. Either they're allowed or they're not, allow, not allowed. Um, but, but Jerry, the surface of the bridge um, related to snowmobiling was a big top of, topic of conversation and it will continue to be. At this point, um, if it's a 14 foot bridge, the the question, I mean, the um, we're compelled to open the master plan and, um, you know, have community dialogue and, and get that approved. Um, because of the 60% the, the markup on the bridge, um, I think that the sort of um, the analysis to make sure that we're really, you know, considering all options, I think that I mean, I, I'm, I'm gathering that that's probably not going to be the route that we take. Um, I think we're, we're really quickly saying the reality here is that this is a 14 foot bridge as was originally um, intended. Um, another piece of this is that we wondered if, um, you know, we, we want to be a good partner to the DNR, of course. Um, and um, I don't know that DNR, that this is, um, you know, really, really big priority for them. They certainly brought it up. It was a responsible thing to do to analyze. I don't know that this is, you know, absolutely, we need to have this. There certainly isn't money at the table. Um, the DNR is no longer adding money into the state grant and aid system. So there, so in terms of um, connecting to trails on the other side, you know, that's, probably not going to happen. Um, the DNR is not offering any um, development dollars here. So I think that this is really, it's been a, a good analysis, um, but I don't know that there's going to be any compelling reasons that we change, you know, our, our the course of the project. Um, one thing I will say is the way that we're um, working on this is we're, um, we're making sure that we don't preclude in the future, like way into the future, if um, if there was ever a desire for this stretch of trail along with the Carver County um, Regional Trail that it connects to, to ever become a part of the, the state trail system. Um, 
we're trying to do that in a way that we don't preclude that from happening. Um, we kicked around whether that was a question that we needed to discuss in the near term. We feel like it's really a longer term question um, that as long as we are not precluding doing something you know, that would prevent that, um, that we're on the right track. Um, I wanted to also mention, Jerry, you had asked about fish and wildlife. So the, the orange area here, this is all DNR Parks and Trails land. Um, the green area and the pink area, those are both privately held. Um, and south of this green area, we don't have it labeled here, but this is US Fish and Wildlife property. So that's the, the wildlife refuge. This parking lot here, um, services the fish and wildlife um, property. This is the Louisville Swamp parking lot. Mm -hmm. um, in the wintertime, snowmobiles use this parking lot and they head in this way to the Minnesota Valley State Trail. Um, this is also a, a, tra a hiking trailhead. The master plan that we worked on um, that Fish and Wildlife was a part of um, 10 years ago highlights this as a, um, that this would be used as a shared parking lot with the regional trail. Um, so that's what we are still working towards. Um, let's see, uh, what else? Um, oh, I know, I wanted to mention one other thing. This green area is the um, focus of the, um, the Met Council has two sites located in Scott County for their future um, wastewater treatment plant. And the green area is their preferred site. Um, they're, I believe, working with the landowners. I don't know that, um, uh, I don't know that they're actually negotiating a purchase, but they're in conversations with them. And one of the things that um, we potentially are looking at is if that was a Met Council property, there may be some opportunity in the project once we're under construction in looking at um, wetland mitigation on the green property um, to help us with any impacts up in the orange property. So I just wanted to mention that as well. And then lastly, I have one other um, diagram, the one that is included in your packet that I just wanted to chat about because we've had some, um, there's been quite a bit of conversation and interest in, um, let's see here, winter use of the regional trail. And for whatever reason, it was not, um, just a sec here, it was not a really big part of the master plan conversation. I wasn't as directly involved in the master plan. Um, let's see, where did it go? I wasn't as directly involved in that master plan. So I'm not sure about um, the circumstances surrounding it, but I will tell you that, um, oh shoot, just a second, I've lost my, there we go. Um, There's been quite a bit of um, chatter about the Miriam Junction Trail providing a really great um, winter um, acts or winter opportunity for snowshoeing and cross country skiing. Um, and I'm looking for some just thoughts and input here. Um, the trail is planned as a, a 10 foot wide surface with the two foot um, shoulders. And as I, we mentioned before, the bridge, all of the bridge crossings probably being about 14 feet. And um, in many of the, the ski trails that I'm familiar with, um, it's a loop situation. Um, so they're, they're one way. And, you know, this is obviously a linear um, amenity. Um, you know, just what are people's thoughts? Is this a realistic um, environment for um, cross country skiing, um, do we have enough room for it to be two way? Um, I think it's potential that it could be pretty popular, um, but how popular, you know, does, does it, um, 
you know, in the first five years, you know, does it have use as, as much as, um, you know, some of the, the far, the further out regional parks? I, I don't know, it's hard to say. I know that in the summertime, the Carver County Trail that connects to this on the north side, um, I think it sees about 100,000 visits. So while this might seem like the, you know, it's a little bit off the beaten path, I think there's a potential that this will be an amenity that's really sought out. Um, so I've put this schem schematic up here and I'm really interested to hear, especially from the skiers in the group, um, with a, a linear, you know, out and back, um, would this be a viable informal cross country situation? Um, if we had volunteers grooming it, you know, which would we ever be able to do um, skate ski and classic ski? If we we're gonna do one, you know, what would be the preferred? Just looking for some initial, you know, thoughts because I don't think we've ever delved into really deeply the winter use of this trail. And I guess with that being said, we're gonna to defer to Eric for his comments. <laughs> I just, have a, I just have a couple to say on this one, right? First of all, I do appreciate that they're going to try to have a cross-country ski trail down there. Um, second, and I'll talk about which which one I would pick. Um, and second, I would think there's going to be a lot of people walking down there with their dogs, fat biking. I think it's going to almost have to be like a all-purpose trail. As much as I would like it to be a, just a straight cross-country ski trail, I don't think that's going to work. I mean, we've already seen that at Murphy and Tara Soaks and Cleary where people are walking on these trails because they don't realize that it's just a ski trail, for example. So I would think whatever we do, I think you need to have it be all purpose from my perspective. And one of the things I was gonna bring up is last week I was at Mini Washita, um, cross country ski trails over there just north of Chaska. And they do have one section or a couple of sections that are two way. So they actually, and I don't know how wide it was, I would guess it's somewhere between 10 and 12 feet wide but they had it wide enough where you have skating and then you have one classic track and it was two way traffic. So if someone was coming at you, you just have to get mm -hmm. off to the side so they could pass you and vice versa. So I would think you could do something similar to that. So that would be maybe, it would be something similar to the upper right corner where you have a single classic track on one side and then you keep it um, groomed for skating or walking on the left side, if that makes sense. Did you say the so, upper right? Yeah, the upper right corner of that one where it has two people walking right there. Because what do you, or the two people skiing, I can't tell what that is. Two people skiing, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah, skiing. you'd have just, you'd have the ski tracks right on, say you'd have classic tracks and then maybe be two feet, three feet on one side. And then you'd have seven feet of skating, walking, whatever on the other side. Okay. If that makes sense. It does. So it's like almost like a hybrid of what you have out there right now. So the classic that, has its own, and then the snowshoeing, biking, walking, and the skating chair. Yeah, exactly. Something similar to like right, what's right around the golf course today over at Cleary, even though okay. there wasn't a, a track for uh, traditional this morning. Um, I know sometimes they put one in, but I mean, it's just like an all-purpose trail. Otherwise, you know what's going to happen? If you have two traditional tracks, people are going to be walking all over that those tracks. Mm -hmm. This is really good feedback. Okay. There's my two cents, right? Yeah. Madam Chair and Patty, I have a question. The length, um, again, of the Miriam Junction Trail that we're looking at tonight, how long How, how long is that? About 2.2 miles. 2 .2? Okay. Yep. And the river bridge is six to 700 feet long. The big river one. Just looking at the, my notes to see what else I wanted to make you aware of that we're kind of in the midst of analyzing and talking through right now. Um, and then is there a parking lot on both sides? I was just trying to remember what the map looked like. There's a parking, um, the master plan identifies, it suggests a couple on the city of Carver side, mm -hmm. and we have not done a lot of talking about that, so we need to work on that. Um, and then on the Scott County side, it's the Louisville parking lot. Okay. Yeah, and you as soon to be as close enough to the ski yeah, trail, right? 
Yeah, if if a bridge is there and as soon as you cross in Carver, the whole riverfront is developed with lots of parking um, and they actually are starting to do camping along there now too. So parking oh. in Carver is, is not an issue. In terms of parking space? In terms of parking space, correct. Okay. There's a little... Um, kiosk area on the Car Carver Regional Trail. And there's a little local park and parking lot there. And I think, I forget the name of it, but um, I think that was the identified spot um, for parking for this trail. Yeah, the, yeah, the Carver Riverside Park is huge mm -hmm. from a parking perspective. Okay. May I hey, can comment you think from a groomer perspective by chance? Please do. Um, bridges and keeping snow on bridges when mm -hmm. our average temperatures are 30 some degrees and 20 degrees is very, very difficult. Um, something to just think about when you have a 700 foot bridge could be very difficult to actually keep the trail open um, and safe. Um, yeah, I, I could see where it would be nearly impossible and it might be a situation where skiers would have to walk across the bridge either to the carver parking or the restaurants and things in town um, or to if they're accessing the trail from carver walk across and then and then uh equipment up yeah yeah um and if he's a very short bridge at cleary there if we get a one week of 35 degrees, you know, 40 degrees, um, it's practically gone. The snow's gone on there. So it, temperatures, you know, being underneath and above really melts a lot of snow very quickly. So. Thank you, Justin. Um, and we're, we're, Craig and I are meeting with um, a couple, Justin and a few other um, park district folks who do a lot of maintenance on the ski trails and, and operate them on Friday. So um, we'll be hearing more on from their perspective and just different ideas. Craig, was there any other item that you can think of we want to touch on at this point? I think we hit on everything here. Uh, that we've been discussing with our PMT group. Okay. Can I just bring up one thing? Okay, this yes. this 700 foot bridge, you know, I don't know what the cost is gonna be. The trail two and a half miles, it's a dead end trail. I am all for trails, but this sounds like an awful lot of money for a short trail. Yes, maybe 100 years, 50 years down the road, it might expand the trail might expand up uh, County Road 14, but you know that's not in the near future. So, you know, I think we should look at what's the cost and what's the benefits before we go too far on this. Yeah, thank you, Jerry, for those comments. Um, just to make sure everybody has a chance to either respond or comment back. Um, I'm just going to double check with everybody again, real quick, Kristen. Nothing to add right now. Kathy? Well, I just had one question in regards to the snowmobile thing. Was there ever any talk or anybody approached the committee with some other outside financing that they might contribute? You know, snowmobile groups, the people that are kind of keeping up the trails now that are around the county. Um, Madam Chair and Commissioner, so the the snow trails club that we have so we um we talk with those folks regularly um and the funding that they get goes through the dnr to the county to the clubs oh. um and the dnr very specifically said that um they're not expanding that system at all um so the, oh. those yeah those clubs get a little bit of money a little bit of state money and they maintain those those trails um yeah, so there doesn't appear <laughs> appear to be um, so there's not the other club money. Elves don't raise money in. Uh, you know, they do raise a little. Um, but not I think the magnitude here is way beyond yeah. that. Yeah, but good good question. But I I was hopeful that maybe there would be some interesting ideas, and it just doesn't really seem like it. Yeah. 
doesn't. Okay, thank you. Nothing else. Great, thank you. Um, I'm gonna go on and move back and check in with Pat and then Mark. Yeah, this is Pat. Um, I, I guess um, I, I like the project overall, but I think Jerry does raise a good point in terms of the utility of the trail um, until such time as that Louisville search cord corridor trail is also built to connect with the, um, you know, the other trail segments that we're looking to construct in Scott County. But I do think it has, um, you know, obviously very good use for just as another river crossing between the two counties uh, for residents on both sides of the river to have that opportunity. Um, the other thing I was going to ask, um, I, I was just curious, since this is built on a, or is proposed to be built on an old rail bed, is this in any way uh, open to funding from the Rails to Trails Conservancy? I don't know, actually. Um, I feel like that was a discussion during the master plan process, and for some reason that was not a hopeful um, source, Pat, but thank you for bringing that up again. Okay. Let, we should, we'll double check. Okay, that's all, thanks. No comments. Um, I guess I just have um, two quick comments. One is, you know, it's really interesting and attractive to look at snowmobiling just because of that opportunity to add an additional activity, you know, but then at other times I think about within the season, the whole year, what kind of usage would there be? Um, you know, because quite honestly, the snowmobile season in Minnesota seems to be getting shorter and shorter. The other yep. thing that I wanted to comment about is that a lot of our dis previous discussions in my recollection about this trail is that one of the things that made it attractive for a project that we had approved to proceed on is that it connected us to such a huge network of already completed trails by mm -hmm. making that connection into Carver, into Chaska, and then pretty much the whole, uh, the whole rest of the Twin Cities area. Um, but I do wanna point out that um, although this is a small segment, I think it has the potential to be a pivot point for future trails going, spreading out from there just like Miriam Junction itself was a junction that brought together Scott County um, with the rail line coming from Montgomery, New Prague, Jordan, um, and connecting there and then moving on through the rest of Scott County. I think this trail location, um, it remains true that that's the potential junction point to service the, a, a lot of the other portions of the county um, besides um, Shakopee and Savage, but connecting to them. And of course, if we make a connection into Jordan and New Prague, we're now making a connection up to two more um, parks in that area and the possibility of Blakely. Um, so to me, it still is a real viable project. Uh, Madam Chair, can I point out just a couple of things on the image here on the screen? Yes, please. Um, Jerry and others, I just wanted to make sure that we updated you on the trails that have that are in place today, um, because it's pretty significant. I, you know, there's the the new um, overpass that was built here. There is actually trail built from this point um, over 169, and it stops here over by the corn the corn maze, um, and then this point over here is all built. So the so it's definitely not you know, just a, a small little two mile um, section of paved trail. I mean, it really connects to the greater, the greater system. Um, another thing that we're looking at related to this trail is that um, we th we're thinking of it more as a destination trail. Um, it almost, because of its location, it almost, well, it, in the, the, obviously the really big deal of being next to the Minnesota River for hundreds and hundreds of feet is that um, it's almost like a, a park destination. Um, so definitely gets beyond just sort of that typical, oh, it's a couple mile regional trail. Um, really, that's all else I wanted to, to add to the conversation. 
Great, thank you. And I just wanna give an opportunity for anybody to respond or comment back. Please go ahead. Okay, without hearing any other um, people making any other comments or suggestions, I'd like to move on on our agenda item. Um, if you do have something you wanna add, we certainly have that opportunity later in the agenda for our at our advisory commissioner report time. Um, next, we wanted to talk about the 2021 PAC meeting dates. Um, this is something we had talked about last meeting and everybody was gonna take a look at their calendars. So Patty, is there a recommendation from staff or Yep, so just to kind of get our uh, minds back into this. So the chart that you see with our calendar days, um, we've listed our regular um, monthly meeting dates. So the first Monday of every month. Mm -hmm. And um, there's the two summertime months that we often choose a different date. Those are italicized. So July 7th would be a, our typical meeting date. Oh, actually, would it be the first? Or no, it would be the seventh. I thought that maybe it was a typo. Um, and August 4th. Um, and last time we were together, we debated um, whether June 30th would be a, um, a good replacement for the July 7th meeting to avoid um, the holiday, Independence Day. Um, and then we were looking at possibly changing the August 4th to, a lot, to August 11th um, to help support some um, staff vacation time. And I think the commissioners, you were gonna look at your plans, your summer plans, and I'm sounding really optimistic, aren't I, with summer <laughs> vacation plans here. And so hopefully folks have had a chance to do that. Um, uh, and I, I think we did, I think last month we proposed that June 30th would made more sense. Um, so I will, at least for picking uh, PAC meeting dates, I'll leave it at that, that maybe I'll, I'll propose June 30th be, um, a replacement for the July 7th meeting. Does anybody have any comments or conflict with that? You know, every year we go through the same thing about these couple of months. Would it be easier if we changed our meeting to the second Wednesday of the month instead of the first? And then we wouldn't have that conflict for Memorial Day, 4th of July and Labor Day. No, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm flexible, I can do anything, but you know, every year we go through the same thing. And mm -hmm. if we moved it one week back, it would eliminate a lot of these discussions. That's an interesting point. I, um, but maybe I, the boardroom isn't opened. You know, maybe, right. maybe, you know I'm not right. saying I wanna do this. It's something that maybe it should be talked about between our chair and, and Patty. You know, yeah. and make a recommendation back if you know if you want to keep it the same that's fine with me but every year we go through the same thing yeah what i'd like to suggest for the purposes of today's meeting is that we go ahead and select these dates for the rest of the year but it, that is something that patty and i can follow back up with and i think um there is that conflict of running into um scheduling time related to other meetings that would be going on you know, taking taking over that week then. Because um, as you know, that, that government building, especially once we get reopened, um, gets used up and in, in quite a bit. So that's something that we can follow up with. Um, so for the purposes of just this year, um, does that June 30th date, um, I'm gonna proceed with, with that as our selection, unless right now anybody has any other questions or comments. So then if we're going to June 30th, um, to me, it makes sense that we will probably miss the July meeting, but certainly can point out that there's the joint board meeting July 15th. And as I recall, that's a daytime meeting, but certainly any commission members are, are invited to attend that virtually, which would be great. Um, and then I believe the next meeting probably would be August 11th. Is that how everybody else is tracking it? Patty, am I correct? In you got it. Those are the two proposals, June 30th and August 11th. Any conflicts? Nope, sounds good. All right. Nope, I'm fine. I'm good. 
Good. It's all good. Yeah, good for now. Who knows what's going to happen? Yeah. <laughs> we we do know to plan for the unexpected, right? Yep. Uh, with that in mind, we'll just go ahead with our next agenda item, number nine, informational items. Um, some updates from Patty, I believe. Madam Chair, can we quickly get some direction on the tours and field trips? Oh, yes, I'm sorry. So I am proposing that um, staff proceed to coordinate two to three pre-meeting field trips for the year and one to two field trips uh, voluntary on a weekend or a non-pack um, evening. Um, and we would, in the next couple of months, we'd come back with our ideas for the May to July time period. Um, and then we'd, um, we would loop back with any field trips for the remainder of the year. So part of the thinking is some of the field trips may um, coincide with, for instance, the Cleary Master Plan. So we want to be a, keep it a little bit flexible, um, but we also mm -hmm. want to give at least um, a month or two notice so that commissioners can look at their calendars and see if they can attend a pre-meeting um, field trip. So are you okay with us coming back and saying, okay, in May, we'd like to have a pre-meeting um, field trip and um, on June 30th, and here's what it is. Yes, and, and the understanding with these pre-meeting field trips are of course that, that they're optional related to every, uh, each individual's ability to attend and participate? Yes. We're trying to support um, the opportunity for the Park Commission to maybe see different areas of our system um, and to gather together, <laughs> God willing, um, <laughs> um, enjoying, you know, different areas of, the, of our park system. Yeah, um, we wouldn't be formally talking about um, PAC business. If that were to happen, we would let folks know beforehand so that we can figure out how we want to do that and if people can actually be there. Right. All right, that sounds excellent. So if I understand correctly, um, you're proposing the dates and the dates for it, but the actual location and timing you and your staff will continue to work on? And then we're still looking at which month as well. Well, so we'll yep. come back with a which where when does it make sense and where? And we we're we'll match it with our um, work plans. So if there is an opportunity to share work plan during the, the field trip um, to make that connection, we will do that. So we just need a little more time to think that through. Sounds that good. Sounds, sounds good. All right. Um, now maybe it's an appropriate time to move on to item number nine, informational items. Very quickly, um, just an update that we will be going to the county board um, for recogn their recognition of the Big Woods Regional Trail name um, in the next four weeks, next three to four weeks. Um, we discovered that um, we will not be seeking Met Council approval of that name, possibly for some time. They have told us that that takes a master plan amendment and we're gathering that the board and county leadership would not want us to put time into that. So we're gonna be really efficient and we're gonna um, acknowledge the name locally. And this is not unusual. Many of the other agencies have been through this. Um, and then when the next time the Met Council does a system plan update, we will um, go ahead and, and have them recognize the name. Um, and then I wanted to mention the equity grant program the Met Council just in the last week announced the grant program. This is the program that only the 10 implementing agencies may apply for. Um, there's quite a bit more money than there was last time. This is the second round that they've ever done. Um, there's funding for capital projects and program related projects. And we, I really wanted us to come and give you a little more detail tonight. We just were not able to do that. Um, but I'll quickly mention the three ideas we are pulling together. Um, and I'll ask Nathan and Alyssa if I'm miss <laughs> missing something to um, chime in here. Um, do you remember last time we looked at, we asked for funding to help us do update all of our brown signs and to add some graphics to them. We're going to um, tweak that a little bit and resubmit it. 
we're also considering submitting um, a capital project to improve the shore fishing um, situation down at Cedar Lake Farm. Super popular, not enough places for people to go. They're trampling some of the shore um, uh, buffer plantings, common issue. Um, uh, but it's not a cheap fix. So that's um, an area that we may um, ask for funding. Um, and the third is related to the work that Alyssa has been doing with um, several partners around the Healthy Hour um, programming. And there's a lot of different directions that could take. Um, what I'll offer now is they're looking at um, having the grant fund staff time to offer more programming in a variety of areas and they're still brainstorming that. I also want to mention that unfortunately the turnaround time for the grants is only six weeks. Doesn't give us a ton of time um, at all. I let them know that I was not happy about that. Even though we kind of knew it was coming, I said you really ought to do two months. They didn't listen. They didn't take my um, request and um, and change the, the timing. So we when we get back um, or when we next see you, really out of necessity, these projects are gonna be pretty well baked. And I just wanna acknowledge that. Um, so I do, um, uh, yeah, I just offer that. This isn't intended to be an agenda item, um, um, but I wanted to you know, acknowledge that and make you, make you aware of it. Um, and then we also um, need to be checking in with the county board to get permission to submit the grant. So there's a couple administrative, pretty big administrative items that we need to do. And for the third item, Barb, do you want to introduce this um, before I, the nature? Yeah, I'd, yeah, I'd love to. Um, so I uh, was thinking a little bit about um, what some of the challenges have been to our parks, especially during the last year. And one comment that Pat made and was repeated again today, um, or some, a similar sentiment was that while it's great, our parks are getting a lot of use, um, we might be loving them to death, meaning that are there challenges of having so many people and the impact it has on the nature side of parks. And I really want to, um, much like we bring an equity lens to some of the discussions we are having about things we're doing with parks, I'd like to introduce having kind of a, a nature lens also um, emphasize, and Patty and her team have always done, I think, a fantastic job of keeping us informed and moving forward with preservation of natural lands, um, plants, animals, everything, waterways, and that's all very, that's so, so important that we continue that partnership in our parks. And so I look at this, nat this nature connection as an opportunity for us as park board members to um, be more mindful of what the nature connections are that we have within our park system and then also within our individual with this within our individual um, lifestyles we often talk about the benefit of getting out in nature um, and it's just an opportunity to practice what we preach and to carve out a little bit of time for everybody to actively search out those nature encounters or those nature experiences both positive and negative or nature observations and just carve out a little bit of time for staff to share some further things and for individuals to share those. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping that we can um, move forward this year with more opportunities to participate in nature. And I don't have any parameters about what that could be. It could be something verbal. It could be sharing a lovely picture like Patty's doing. It could be something as simple as that. Um, or a, a nature observation, um, preferably within one of our Scott Pont County parks, but obviously anywhere. Um, so I do want to take the time to make a nature connection. Thank you. Um, Madam Chair and Commissioners, so the way that staff is interpreting this is that we will, um, every month on the agenda, um, just take a tiny amount of time to pause, um, and, and obviously we need photos to make it really work, um, collect photos of something that we wanted to share where there was some kind of nature connection. Maybe it's 
just um, something that a staff member experienced. Maybe it's something that during an event like we have here, where we had a really cool nature connection. Um, and just, just share a little bit about it. Um, so for this one, we have four photos that were taken back in October. Um, Nathan and Alyssa had um, uh, coordinated and promoted those, um, I think there were four or five events, hoping to um, get folks in the community um, to stop at Cleary Lake and consider to be a part of our um, resident strategy team for the master plan. And during that sort of, um, hey, here's what a master plan is and, and let's go for a hike, um, we had some really awesome nature encounters. Um, so I think we had maybe um, eight or nine um, residents join us. Um, we had one family that had a few kids. Um, I think Barb um, Hedstrom was there and brought a friend and we saw, um, we went on a little um, scavenger hunt and we found a leopard frog. That's what you see on the left. Um, we did some leaf collection. We had a little um, friendly competition on who could find the largest leaf. Um, and we, they're holding up a bur oak and what I think is a Northern red oak. Um, and then we found a fruit from a tree and I can't remember what we decided it was. We looked it up and I'm forgetting. Does anyone remember that was there? I don't remember, Nate. <laughs> Nate ended up, I think, had an app that helped us identify it. So it was a great connection of technology <laughs> and nature right there. It's still a mystery. Yeah, um, it was some sort of chestnut. Okay. Um, and then we have a picture of some of the group members that were with us. So just, just wanted to share that. It was a very lovely day. Well, um, with that in mind, we're going to move right on into advisory commissioner reports. And with everybody's um, consideration, I'll go ahead and get started. And I thought I would start because I don't have anything real specific. Um, I would start, I thought I'd start with my nature connection story um, as an example. Um, just this week, I was at Spring Lake Park specifically looking for owls because it's mating season for owls. And in the past, I've seen barred owls in the park. And I know that there's a lot of um, big trees um, that have cavities in them where owls will nest. And so I was hoping to spot and tried to call in a barred owl. I didn't have any success, but I did talk to a couple on the trail as I was leaving. And they pointed out to me that there was an owl ahead. So I rushed ahead to look at it. And I was very surprised and happy to see a great horned owl, which is oh. one I had not seen in a couple years. And um, if just to share a little bit about those type of owls, they have, as all owls, excellent hearing and eyesight. And they say that if you can see an owl, if you can see a great horned owl with their hearing being as well developed as it is, that they can actually hear your heartbeat if you're within vision sight of them. So I figured that explains why as soon as I saw him, he took off and flew away. He or she, I don't know if it was he or she since they're nearly identical. So that's my nature connection story. And I wish I had gotten a photo to share to post and forward on to Patty. So I'm gonna just go ahead and call on everybody again for anything that they wanna share. Kristen? Um, it's really exciting to see, this is probably the busiest year I've ever seen for winter activity at Cedar Lake Farm. Um, there's not a day that there aren't, you know, dozens of cars in the parking lot with using the trails um, in the park since they're, they've been really well maintained. And I think that's, you know, people are looking for that. Um, and then using the park as access to the lake is, uh, I've never seen it like this. It's just, it's really neat to see people continue, I, you know, when they found the park through the, you know, the beginning last year, spring, I, you know, it just it keeps growing and growing and growing and it's, it's fun to see. So uh, last week when I took a walk, walk through there, it looks like people are, you know, using the fire pit areas and having fires, you know, through the winter. And it's, it's just really nice. Thank you. Kathy. 
I don't really have anything to nature report for Scott County. I've been getting up more doing walking on Lake Minnetonka because I have to go up there for other things. And that's been just gorgeous. And speaking of a lot of people, there's I think there's been more ice fishermen than, than ever before. I've seen that on Lake Minnetonka for sure. And then just down here around Dean Lake, it's just been gorgeous and a lot of, lot of eagle sightings as I walk down, you know, where I live is there's some pretty extensive trail system down behind me around Dean Lake. And that's been so pretty and so many birds and the um, eagles have been out in full force. So that's been nice. Great, thank you. Jerry? Yeah, I got two, um, walk the landing and SM Hinch just moved a bunch of heavy equipment in. So I think they're putting in the bridge, mm -hmm. which we've been waiting for for a few years. And my second one is, I didn't experience this, but I'm, I was in my back garage and I looked up and I had five pairs of skis, cross country skis in my rafters. They've been up there for 40 years. I put, put brought them down, I dusted them, I put them on, a website I offered for 90 bucks one day and the next day I dropped it to five and the next day I dropped it to zero. A family from Savage came. There was a bunch of kids. These were my kids and our, and they took them off. And so now that family has experienced outdoors. Oh, that's cool. Excellent. Thank you. Eric. Well, I've been spending every day on the snow since uh, late December. So Snow has been really good. Justin's team has been doing a fantastic job. They were out there this morning just grooming uh, Cleary. It's been great. I think they started doing rentals maybe about a week and a half ago. And the turnout on like this past weekend was just nuts. I've never seen so many people out there on the trails, right? Um, it wasn't overly crowded. Uh, everybody was kind of spread out. So social distancing was good. And the parking lot was full, right? So things are looking very positive from that perspective. I did have the opportunity to go Murphy Hanrahan and ski there last week. And that's always a challenge and an opportunity to see what it's like. And team's done a good job. We do need more snow out there. Mm -hmm. um, there have been a lot of people walking out there as well. And then, you know, it's hard to tell people not to walk out there, right? If you don't see them, right? It's like, you know, you they do a good job putting signs out there. People should be aware of it, but people still walk out on this trail. So, um, I did run into a few other people that didn't even know that we had like a all-purpose trail right around the golf course so they could take their dogs out there. There were people out there skiing at Cleary with their dogs right around the tr regular trail. And I pointed that out to them and they said, oh, that's great. I didn't even know that. So, you know, it's just, it just comes down to awareness, mm -hmm. you know. And then the, the other thing I mentioned, I went out to Mini Washita, very nice park, right? And it's always nice for um, benchmarking. So I think, you know, maybe one of those things in the future, if we do go out to different parks, take photos of the parks and just bring them back to the team. They've got a beautiful looking playground and swim beach area that it would be nice to have, you know, at Cleary eventually. Great, That's thank it. you, Eric. Pat. Uh, yeah, I can just give you an update on a couple of things I've been working on actually with Alyssa. One of them I've mentioned to this group in the past is something, well, I guess both of these projects, I'm wearing uh, my work hat over in Carver County and then my commissioner hat here in Scott County. But the ARB access program that we started with the Landscape Arboretum in Carver County to make access to the Arboretum available for lower income people, specifically um, Health and Human Services clients of Carver County um, I had a meeting with Alyssa and some other uh, Scott County staff, uh, I think it was just last week, um, to expand the program into Scott County so that uh, residents of Scott County who are clients of Scott County Health and Human Services will soon be able to have that same opportunity to obtain a free measure, uh, membership to the Landscape Arboretum. So I'm excited about that. And the other thing that I've been working on um, that we alluded to a little bit earlier was the whole Park RX program. And Alyssa and I and some other partners from Scott and Carver County um, decided we're gonna go down a path in the uh, nearer future to um, try to get a deeper understanding of 
uh, the barriers that specific population groups are experiencing um, to accessing our parks uh, at a more, I guess, uh, local geographic area. And so initially we're exploring whether or not we want to do this with the uh, Latino population, uh, specifically those that uh, reside in the Shakopee area, as well as the Chaska area. So we're kind of gearing up to see uh, if we can do that and what we can learn from it. So look forward to reporting back on that. Great, thank you, Eric. And just to check in with Mark next. Um, other than looking forward to getting outside and enjoying our sub-zero highs this weekend, I have nothing else to report, <laughs> Madam Chair. Oh, are you going camping? Is that what you're telling yeah. us? You're going to do some sub-zero camping maybe? Sure, yes. All right, we'll need photos. Uh, I will make sure <laughs> to get them from my couch. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and then Commissioner Ulrich. Not exactly sure if I'm missing him, if he is still on. So we're just going to, Commissioner, if you have anything, please uh, unmute and join us. If not, we're going to move ahead to um, our last agenda item, which is upcoming meetings, the Mark, March PAC meeting, tentative topics. Um, Patty, what are your comments related to that agenda item? Yep, just trying to reshare here. Um, all right, Tyler Thompson's going to join us, and he is going to share a little bit of um, a review of 2020 programs, um, but mostly looking at um, 2021. They've done a lot of, you can imagine, learn new things, change the way things are being done. They're, um, he'll have a lot of sort of, uh, here are their new ideas, here's what worked. Um, and then plans for 2021. And then also, this, so this is new for you. Um, the park district has identified a project that is um, just kicking off. And, um, and Eric, you've brought this up, the need for this the last couple of meetings. And I definitely think it's been a need for years. And I'm so happy to report that they're gonna be working on it. They have a project to look at internal park signage. Um, and they've identified the team and we um, are happy to report Dario's on that team. And then I also advocated for the park commission to have a role. So um, they, um, Luke Skinner, one, the associate superintendent of the park district and um, Lynn um, Stoltzman, Lynn is Tom, um, Tom Bulk's boss. She's leading the project. They are gonna join us at next month's meeting. And I, I believe Dario is, but I'm not positive. And they're gonna share more about the project goals. And I'm super excited that the Park Commission can be involved in this. So be thinking about um, what you've noticed or maybe heard from others um, related to park signage, our parks and other parks, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I'm super happy about that. And, um, I do not, I have not heard anything on budget, so we won't be talking about budget and 15 year vision may or may not happen depending on if I get time with county leadership before then. So that's what we're anticipating for March. Okay. Are we looping back for the March meeting to put the equity grant program, just an update on that then? Let's, yep, let's do that. Okay. I'll plan on that. All right, just a, a call out for anybody's last comments or closing remarks. Otherwise, uh, we'll entertain a, I'll, I'll have just one, pause for a moment. I'll have one last remark. I want to piggyback on what Pat was saying about the Latinos and how, you know, how do we get these people in? Well, yes. when Justin gave his presentation, the thing that really hit me was a lot of people still think we charge and that went away 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. I think in the, in the scene, you know, you got your logo, you got everything. I think free admission or free something should be advertised everywhere. Our, uh, Three Rivers has their, their presentation or advertising or whatever. Free admission should also be included on with their logo. Because, you know, maybe these minorities don't think that you know, there is a charge for it. That could be one reason why they're staying away. And it's something we've never talked about. But when Justin brought it up, I thought, you know, we're, we're looking at 
ways to get people in, and that might be one way of keeping people out. Amen. Absolutely. Anybody else with any other comments? Um, hearing none, do we have a motion to adjourn? Move to adjourn, Ewart. Second? Or excuse me, any discussion? Further discussion? Got to have a second. Second. Yep. Oh, second. Sorry. Your luck. I. Okay. All those in favor, thank you, Jerry. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All right. Again, thank you, everybody, for your patience. And I know we ran a little long, and I apologize. And uh, we'll get back on, back on track um, and look forward to our next meeting. Yeah, thanks, Barb. Great job. Thanks, Barb. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Bye-bye. Yep. All right. Bye. Patty, would you mind, Could um, Nate, could you guys just stick around for just one second? I want to try one other technology thing um, to see if that